<laughs> Welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI, where every week uh, we dive into some of the newest and coolest research papers in machine learning and AI with the hopes that you will then be able to apply them to your work. So this week we are going over a paper called Discrete Diffusion Modeling by Estimating the Ratios of the Data Distribution by these three wonderful researchers at Stanford University and Pika Labs. And this is a paper that is fundamentally about applying diffusion techniques, which we've discussed in past dives, but also are kind of more widely known uh, for image work like stable diffusion and video work like Lumiere, and taking those and applying those to natural language generation. So this paper is not the first time that you know a, a group of authors has attempted to make text diffusion work. Um, there have been you know past uh, stabs at this with varying success, but this kind of paper's core contribution is that it's the first time that those approaches have been competitive for the same model size uh, with the kind of autoregressive next token predicting models um, like the GPT series. The way that they achieve this is through a novel loss function that they introduce called score entropy. And you know that's kind of how we get the name of these score entropy discrete diffusion models. So autoregressive modeling was, was completely dominant before this and the discrete uh, diffusion approaches that have existed for text were never really able to match up. Like I said, because of this loss function, um, these models are now able to match performance at a similar model, model architecture and model size on GPT-2, which is really exciting uh, because we were really nowhere close to this before this paper. But I can hear the objections that, you know, GPT-2 kind of was published in, I believe, 2019. We are on GPT-4, GPT-4 plus 5, right around the corner now. So what is so exciting about a diffusion approach that is matching performance with a 2019 class um, autoregressive model? The biggest thing is that um, a lot of researchers believe, and I find it pretty compelling, that there are some inherent limitations to this autoregressive style of modeling, where to predict token i, you use all of the tokens i minus 1 back to 0 before that to condition that distribution. First one of these drawbacks is that you have to you know, sample your tokens, and you have to produce your generation sequentially in order from, from left to right. There are things that we can do to parallelize this more effectively at training time, um, but at inference time, that still kind of imposes a structural limitation on how the data is actually being generated. This also kind of prevents us from doing techniques like infilling, where if you think, you know, there are examples in uh, imagery diffusion work where if you kind of take a square out of the center of an image, you can fill it in um, using a diffusion model. We can't do that if we're strictly prompting from left to right. And prompting from left to or sorry, generating tokens from left to right is also slower, less parallelizable, um, because we have to know what came before a token before we generate that token. Last big reason here, and we'll go over these again at the end when we talk about how this SEDD model improves on this, is that sequentially sampled outputs have been shown to degenerate as the sequence continues to go on, you know, and, and continue to generate tokens. There are techniques. Um, that have been developed sort of as the sequence gets longer to ameliorate this called annealing techniques. Um, one of them, which we'll talk about later, is called nucleus sampling. And the authors posited this as uh, these authors are able to, through diffusion, be able to achieve the same level of performance as these autoregressive models without having to kind of bolt on these additional techniques that kind of clip and, and change the distribution um, as they go. So that's kind of why we are interested in the first place. Um, in kind of this different modeling approach, this non-autoregressive modeling approach, and doing this via diffusion. I want to step back from this a little bit and motivate why we want to do this diffusion modeling and why this is kind of where we arrive when we look at ways that we can uh, you know, generate text without being autoregressive. And fundamentally, what we are doing when we are trying to make a generative AI model is create something which is going to approximate a data distribution or a data population that we care about as closely as possible. That distribution could be anything. Um, it could be like the entirety of, you know, nice, well-structured sentences. It could be bug-free best practice Python code. And then in the worlds of generative imagery and video, it could be, you know, photorealistic images or cute cartoon images or, you know, any type and we condition it from there. And that's our goal, right? But how do we actually go about accomplishing that? So there's a thought experiment um, that Jeremy Howard uses in his um, series, I believe is called like machine learning or, you know, foundations to stable diffusion. It's available on YouTube and linked here. And his thought experiment that I think motivates us really well is what if we had some arbitrary magic black box 
that for whatever input we give it, um, that it would tell us the probability that that input is a member of the population that we are looking to model. So if we feed in a sentence that says like fish are awesome people, that would give us a, a probability. We don't really know how to contextualize this yet. Um, but if we have this, is there a way that we can use this magic thing, assuming that it exists and works perfectly, um, to generate progressively better and better sentences over time? And how would we do that? The answer to that is that we could make a couple of tiny changes to that input sentence, to those tokens that we're feeding in, and see how the probability changes and the output as a result. And then we could take the best output and continue to refine it from there. This would be a very lengthy process to do manually, but you can imagine computers being able to do this um, a lot more effectively and in parallel. So here's an example of that, where we take our fish are awesome people input, we feed into our magic block, our magic black box, some other variations on that. Fish are orange people, fish are aquatic people. And these have uh, kind of changed the probabilities that come out the other end. What this tells us here is that fish are aquatic people, while not perfect, is a more likely sentence to have come from our data distribution than fish are are awesome people. And again, all of these numbers are completely arbitrary, but demonstrative. What we would then do from there is continue to repeat that process, taking our best option from the previous iteration, right? We could take our fish are aquatic people because we saw that was some type of improvement um, and continue to move forward from there. So now instead of riffing on fish are awesome people, we're riffing on fish are aquatic people. Now, you know, we one of those tweaks leads us to say fish are aquatic animals. We see a huge jump in the probability there. Um, and we keep going from there. And now we're able to reliably generate more and more uh, faithful sentences to our to our underlying target population. And uh, end of talk, we have now solved generative language modeling, and that's wonderful, um, but obviously not the case. So this is something that just kind of you hear it and you're like, yeah, that probably doesn't work. Uh, but let's investigate why so that we can see how diffusion solves it. Any questions up to this point? Cool. So the most obvious problem with this is that this P of X function, this magical black box is not something that we have. So in statistics land, we can call this by a different name. We can call it the probability mass function of that data distribution that we're trying to generate. The authors refer to this as P data throughout the paper. I find that very reasonable. Um, as a statistics refresher, we know that for any distribution, the probability mass function, which we just defined, is a function that maps input to their output probabilities under that distribution. And a kind of concrete example of this, which, by the way, was auto-generated by uh, asking ChatGPT to give me this thing and is by, by all uh, indications correct, is the random event of let's flip 10 coins and see how many heads we get. Right, this graph should be intuitive. Five heads would be what you would expect most often, and you would consider zero heads or ten heads to be extremely outlying events. But the key is, if you were, you know, looking at this function and trying to figure out what the most likely outcome is without knowing it ahead of time, you could feed in zero, see that that doesn't work, and step up towards five from there. We're looking to do the same kind of thing um, with this underlying function. The problem with this is that we are able to model this, you know, this small, small scale event with 10 different inputs um, very easily. But the distribution of things like, you know, helpful, correct English sentences or valid Python code um, is a lot broader and much more high dimensional um, than something like what happens when you flip a coin 10 times. So hey, Ben, quick question. Pro uh, probability mass function versus probability density function. Are they yeah. same thing? So yeah, good question. So the probability density function is kind of a equivalent for the probability mass function, but for <clears throat> excuse me for continuous spaces instead of for discrete spaces. So language modeling is discrete because you have a certain number of tokens and a certain sequence length, and there is a very large number of possible outputs there, but it's a finite one. Um, whereas something like generating an image, you have kind of an infinite continuous sliding scale of pixel values. The only difference with probability density is that you can't really think of those individual point estimates as probabilities, but that is a little beyond the scope. Um, for here, for the probability mass function for discrete events, which is what makes language modeling different, um, they are you, you do think of them as probabilities of that event. Great. Uh, great explanation. And then the next question is, is this similar to Monte Carlo sampling at all? Yeah, so the way that you could actually arrive at a graph like this would be through through Monte Carlo sampling, which would basically just be, you know, flipping, you know, computationally or in real life, 
um, this set of 10 coins recording the answers and you will see over time there'll be some noise but it will converge towards a good estimate of, of this distribution um, this distribution also has an analytic solution um, using like the binomial binomial formula that you can derive um, but approximating it through through Monte Carlo is an, is another good way to get there nice thank you mm -hmm. so what do we as deep learning practitioners do when we have a problem that you know we're looking to estimate a extremely complex function? Well, we grab our, our neural networks and throw a bunch of data from our target population at it, and we estimate that function. So we get something that is not a, a true exact corollary to that theoretical quantity that doesn't you know actually exist and we can't observe, but we train a network to approximate it. And the way that we do this is by instantiating a big network with a bunch of parameters, like I said, feeding in a ton of our data. And we will then be in a world in which we are feeding a sentence into this network like dogs are animals and getting out some scalar value, right? In this case, we're getting out negative 0.25. And this is kind of a problem because what we would want this to output are our probability mass values so that we could do the nice stepping towards a, a more... Uh, more plausible generation that we talked about in the beginning. But probability mass functions and probability density functions have two primary uh, constraints. And those constraints kind of line up with how we think about probability, but there are also requirements for these functions to be valid and these functions to be you know, useful representations of what we're trying to do under the hood. Constraint number one is that any value in a probability mass function, any output for any given X must be uh, positive. It must be greater than zero. <clears throat> Sorry. And this is because, you know, this intuitively makes sense. Um, you can't really have a well-defined concept of a negative probability. And we interpreted the PMF value from earlier as the probability of X occurring. So we have some nice mathematical tools to handle this. Um, when we have things that we want to make positive that are not uniformly positive, we can exponentiate them. So we've now fixed that constraint. We add an extra check on the end of our, our network to exponentiate these values. And now we have something like 0.778 um, that kind of fixes our issue with that first constraint for what makes a valid probability mass function. But we have another problem. And this is, again, just how probabilities work, that the sum of that value for all possible x must equal 1. This is basically saying the probability of every possible thing happening for a given event has to equal 1, which makes sense. Um, and this, you know, just is an example of that that you don't actually need to look at or, you know, in depth besides the fact that it does sum to 1. This is the distribution of the PMF values for that 10 coin flip event that we defined earlier. And notice that they all, they all sum up to 1. So what math tools do we have in our bag to fix this constraint? Um, the biggest one that I can think of and that makes a lot of sense is summing up all of those exponentiated input values to get a normalizing constant that when we divide each input value by that constant, it will scale everything down so that the sum is exactly equal to one. So, all we have to do in this case to get that model and to be able to properly estimate our density is sum across every possible input into this neural network, add up the activations after we exponentiate from all of those, and then we get our normalizing constant that we can divide by, and we're off to the races from there. You probably know where I'm going with this. Um, that normalizing constant is so big. Um, the problem here is this notion of needing to sum up all possible inputs, right? That's not too bad for a coin flip. It's not even too bad for 10 coin flips. That's something that we can define and compute. But for a GPT-2 sized and um, you know input output structured model, the way that the authors are trying to replicate here, GPT-2 and the models used in this paper have a vocabulary of 50,000 know, different possible tokens that you could put into them in their input sequence. And their input sequence is of length 1,024, right? And tokens can be repeated, right? It's not like we have a, a 50,000 factorial problem, which would already be a big problem here. It's we have 50,000 to the 1,024, the number of tokens to the power of the sequence length. That is the, the raw number of, of combinations of possible inputs you could have to a GPT-2 size model. Um, the authors said that this is greater than all of the atoms in the universe, and I think it is actually much greater than that quantity. So um, this is obviously something 
that we are not going to be able to do. Any questions on that? No, but wow, big number. <laughs> <laughs> Very big number. I, I started this thinking I was going to like put it, like paste it into the document um, just to show how big it is. And then I realized that that would uh, be completely impossible. Um, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is a solution to this, right? And this is actually how we arrive at autoregressive modeling. This is a, a very legitimate and possible solution to this conundrum. And I'll show you why. It lets us get out of this intractability. It lets us out of having to deal with 50,000 times, you know, to that power number of different tokens. So when we do autoregressive modeling, what are we doing? We are reframing the, the probability calculation, calculation such that we are not kind of independently viewing all of those tokens at the same time, the same way that we would in a diffusion model. Instead, we are only concerned about the specific token, we'll call it token I, that is being generated since these are generated one at a time at inference time, right? So this means that all of the previous tokens are fixed, right? They're not kind of like degrees of freedom that are varying with the model. And I made a visual for this that is hopefully helpful. The top is, you know, when we're looking at red words here, these are words that can vary as possible inputs when we're looking to cal calculate a probability, right? And in the autoregressive case, any of those words can vary when we're looking to sum up all of the possible inputs for that specific scenario, because we're trying to generate an entire sentence, not one word. So we get 50,000 times 50,000 times 50,000 onto the sequence length. In the autoregressive case, we've already generated here the first three words. They're, they're notated in black. And the last word is the only thing that is going to vary. So the possible options for that are just the token size. So that kind of makes this problem a lot more tractable. It's a big reason, whoops, it's a big reason why it has had so much success so far. But because of the limitations that we mentioned around, um, you know, just the inherent constraints posed by left to right generation, we are actively looking to move beyond that. Um, and that's what this paper is all about. The solution that we will actually use is modeling something called score rather than the probability mass itself. And I will motivate this going back to our experiment from earlier. Remember our magic probability machine? We get outputs from this and we see which direction we want to take a step in, right? How we want our sentences to be more like going forward. Um, but if you notice this, what is important here is not actually... Uh, the raw values, right? We don't need to know that the probability of this is 0.210. Excuse me. We need to know that the probability of it is more than the other things. So we're much more concerned about the directionality in which we need to go um, to have a more probable sentence than the actual value of that probable sentence. We're not interested in the actual value. We're interested in stepping in the right direction, wherever that might point. So we can formulate this mathematically and say that we are, like I said, interested in the direction in which we should move. So we can think about rather than looking at one of these scores in isolation, like the probability of input 1b, we can look at uh, the ratio of those scores to each other. So for example, the ratio of score 1b to, to that of score 0. This then forms a quantity that we can call the, that is called the concrete score. And if we're able to model this quantity, this ratio throughout our network, you can see that this is something that's automatically a lot more tractable because when you divide these two together, that big Z number that was ruining our lives uh, gets canceled out. So all we really need to find out is for any observation in our training data, take some other random input Y like we did up here with our Y zeros. And we don't need to understand what's the probability of that Y versus what's the probability of that X. We just need to understand the relation of those two. Cool. I have an example of modeling this with our networks to understand what a concrete score actually looks like and kind of the direction that they're pointing. So here we're calculating those three things, right? Dogs are animals, let's say purely like gets us an activation that's again, not a valid probability of 0.775. Dogs are fools. I mean, maybe, you know what I mean? I don't think so, right? That gets us something that's much less, pro much less plausible in our underlying data distribution. Cats are animals. That is pretty plausible, right? So if we look at the concrete score, the concrete score of X with regard to Y1 is going to be pretty close to one, right? Saying Y is basic, Y, Y, or sorry, Y2 down here 
is basically as plausible as y1. And you'll notice I have the numbers flipped, so I'm going to flip them back. Um, whereas, you know, the dogs are fools sentence is, you can see through this low concrete score, much less plausible. And like I said, the big deal with this is that this is a quantity that we can actually optimize for in our network because we no longer have a big intractable constant. So we can formulate this into a loss function, which the researchers do. This is what the, um, the, uh, the loss that the paper is named for, the score entropy loss. And there's a lot going on here. I'm happy to take questions on the parameters, but I kind of typed out some intuition for it as well. Remember, when you're having a loss function, you that is something that you want to minimize. It points you in, in the kind of right direction as you work on minimizing that. Um, so what we're looking to model in our network is we have an input observation X. We have a bunch of changes to it, a bunch of Ys that we've considered that are new inputs. And we want to understand which of those inputs make X, make the new kind of, uh, according to our network, are much less likely to have come from our data distribution, like dogs are fools or dogs are broccoli or whatever, and which ones are kind of steps in the right direction. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. There are two final problems with this uh, modeling approach. And the problems that make us unable to calculate this directly, though this is fundamentally the loss function that we are like using in theory, we're just going to look for a, a more tractable theoretical equivalent to it, is that sneakily, this, you know, y is still very large, which we'll talk about. And also this ratio here by which we're checking our work, that the probability of our slightly different version relative to the probability of our input x observation we don't have that. That's the magic black box, right? So uh, we need some other way to estimate that. On the first piece, the set of the possible Y is still very, very large because Y here is defined for each X as every possible input that is not, um, that is not X. So this is a slightly better number than we had before. This is now 5,257 to the 1,024 minus one um, because X is excluded, but we also have to calculate it X number of times. That's obviously not going to work. So what we do or what the authors do, sorry, is they restrict this instead of all possible Y that are not equal to X, they restrict it to all possible Y that are um, close to X. And they define this by having a Hamming distance of one, Hamming distance being the number of tokens that are different from the original sequence. So, you know, the possible set of Y, which are neighbors in graph theory of X, includes dogs chase animals, but does not include, include broccoli are vegetables because that has a Hamming distance of two or seven Ham 18, which has a Hamming distance of three. So that reduces our scope. And in uh, a kind of future practical dive where we go over the actual code implementation behind this, we will talk about um, some further optimizations that allow us to kind of work with that still large number uh, even more effectively. Second big issue is that we don't have that uh, P of X probability mass function. Um, and if you see here, when we are, you know, this is kind of the, the, the golden quantity that we're looking to estimate. Um, this S theta of X here is the value through our network. So as part of this loss function, we get the value through our network. We compare it to the ground truth value, which is P of Y over P of X and penalize it in various ways. But we don't have the ability to check our work with that function because P of Y, you know, the function that gives us P of Y or P of X is our magical uh, black box. So we don't have the key through which to check our answers. And that is why we end up turning to a diffusion process, uh, which we have now arrived at. And this is where the math gets a little crazy. Um, again, we'll be kind of elucidated further through actually digging into the code in a future practical dive, which I'm really excited for. Um, but we're going to give some intuition today for uh, what adding diffusion noise does, and then how that's actually executed by the researchers and what advantages it gives us in the output. So we are entering the diffusion zone. So we can't estimate those probabilities directly, that P function, right? Because we don't know them. But what we can do is add some noise to that probability distribution, random noise that we know and we control, right? And that makes a new distribution that we are able to reason about and we are able to optimize for, and we are able to learn those concrete score ratios. So we have a distribution that we don't understand we add noise to it, 
And now we don't fully understand that distribution, but we know that there is a part of that that is noise that we have added. And we can teach the model to be able to, for a given time step T, um, understand how much noise was added and predict the noise that was added. Because if we can do that, we can then subtract the noise out, just like we do in uh, diffusion for image modeling, and iteratively step our way towards a less and less noisy uh, you know, chunk of text here. So instead of optimizing for and learning what we were showing earlier as that P of Y over P of X, which is the true probability in the underlying data distribution, we are learning the PT of Y and PT of X for a bunch of Ts that we introduce, which are different timestamps. And you can think of them as different amounts of noise that are being able being added to the data, right? And if we're able to learn these, we can facilitate that backward step, uh, which we're going to show in a second here. But any questions up until this point? Okay, that is where we leave most of the math behind and get into the actual kind of implementation of the diffusion process, which I think is very cool. So in past dives, we have talked about uh, diffusion work in imagery and in video. And the way that we add this noise to the distribution of our images, the way that we noise our training data so that we can learn how to unnoise it is by kind of simultaneously, you know, applying some random change to each pixel in the underlying image. And when you do that to this cat here, you apply a little bit of that noise, it's still recognizably a cat, right? There's still signal in the image that you can detect and that you would be able to train a model to reverse. And the authors had this question of, you know, can we do the same thing with text, right? Can we jitter every token instead of every pixel, have it flip to some other pixel? And they argue, and it makes total sense, uh, no, you can't. Because since we're dealing with discrete data instead of continuous data, when you jitter these things all at once, you are losing all of the signal. It's being destroyed immediately, right? There's nothing that we can recover from this initial sentence about how dogs are great friends uh, that is still left in this, in this six blue weasel story. It's like we went from this first image of the cat directly to the last image without these crucial intermediary steps. So we need to leave some signal for our network to be able to learn to recover that. Again, this is a problem with the discreteness of text. So what the authors do instead of changing everything at once is kind of set each token on a timer to, you know, flip to some other token um, independently. So these are not all going to happen at the same time. This is a process, a continuous process that they let run over time, and they sample from it um, at various timestamps along that process to get those various uh, T distributions that they will predict. And um, this is kind of my take on it, you can see that we are iteratively adding this noise, not just immediately changing, you know, one thing in every place and then destroying the entirety of the signal. Um, but the author, the first author on a really awesome blog post um, has a uh, illustration of this, you know, how this kind of goes from an initial sentence that you see in all black to just progressively more and more destroyed, but each token flipping independently so that there is still signal in those intermediate steps. I wonder, and I don't remember if they talk about this at all, but like even those flips are destroying a lot of noise, like because it's discrete and you could flip blue to uh, dog or something like that. It feels like it could be interesting to even perturb in the embedding space itself yeah. rather than the indices. Did they talk about that at all? Uh, I saw some previous work that was talking about like, you know, this is really one of the first, uh, like, really highly performant discrete diffusion models, like operating purely just on those tokens. But there were, I believe, attempts at doing it continuously. And I would think that 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 would be how they do it. Because you're right. If you want to make a small perturbation from dogs are great friends, you the smallest possible perturbation would not be what the authors do, which is, you know, randomly flip one. The smallest would be to change to a similar word, change great to good, change friends to buddies or something like that. So I, I think that's a really good point. Totally. Okay. So this, you know, kind of is, is a nice, like you can kind of think of it as a data augmentation process, right? So we're kind of creating these derived versions of our training data, and then we le learn to uh, reverse that process. So again, we are learning that concrete score from up here for all of the various T timestamps, right? For all of the various levels of noise. And once we have learned that, Oh, sorry. 
Once we have learned that, we are able to kind of use those quantities that we've calculated to step back in the opposite direction and denoise the data. And more than denoise the data, denoise just random noise, right? We can just generate a bunch of words, put it in there, um, and get out a coherent sentence through stepping through that uh, over time. So to generate a new unconditional sample, this is really you know not prompting it, but this is just trusting the model to say whatever it wants to say to you. You start with a noised input sequence in the length of what you want to get as your output. So you know for this case, 1,024 tokens. You then take those concrete scores that were learned and step backwards in time through you know removing a little bit of that noise to the best of the model's ability at each time step. And then when you get back from time, you know, whatever your max T was to T equals zero, you, in theory, if your model is trained well, have a new generated observation that closely resembles your data distribution. And the author has another really great uh, visualization for this, um, moving in the other direction, starting from total noise and gradually introducing signal uh, through that reversal process. But uh, random samples are fun, um, but conditioned samples that we were able to guide and get kind of, you know, what we want via prompting are even better. Um, so this is pretty intuitive rather than starting with a fully noised sample. Instead, um, insert some tokens rather than a fully random token list uh, that you are interested in retaining. Maybe it's the first two. And then you only apply that iterative denoising um, process to the tokens that you did not provide. So this is kind of my take on what that looks like. If you were to just prompt with dogs are, you initialize the rest with random noise and then only perform those denoising steps on the part of the sequence that you did not provide. The interesting sneak peek with this that we'll get into when we talk about why this is all a good thing to do is that this is really the only way that you can prompt auto arrested LLMs, right? Start at the beginning. Um, but you can prompt much more creatively uh, with these, which is really interesting. You could do every other word if you want and just have kind of it alternate with uh, with randomly generated words that are then diffused within the context of your sentence that you already provided. It makes me think of uh, code completion, too, because you might want like context on the top and context on the bottom and then fill in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just so much more efficient to be able to do that directly and naturally rather than uh, saying you know, as a part of your full prompt saying, hey, do all of this and then have the LLM have to repeat your beginning and your end and fill in the middle um, in a way that's coherent. But this doesn't, this doesn't have the ability to change the length of the text in this case, right? You can only change individual tokens. Correct. Um, so like this, you're, you are still kind of limited by your input sequence or sorry, your desired output sequence length. Yeah. Um, but you could kind of have the the you could still get short um, short output sequences by just having you know like early stops being predicted yeah. and by the model. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's what they did. Um, the question then becomes, how well does it work? Um, and in particular, how does it perform to a the existing text diffusion approaches that existed prior to this paper, and B, those autoregressive techniques um, that have been state of the art for so long. So what we're using for evaluation here is the perplexity score um, for the unconditional tasks, which again, the heuristic um, is how perplexed is the model by the generated sample, right? So less perplexed is more coherent, more likely text. Um, so that's a better, a better thing. Here is their eval table on a variety of data sets across uh, against, you know, they compared their small model to GPT-2 small model, so similar size there. You can see the SEDD absorb and uniform are two variants of uh, their the author's technique, which only kind of vary in the matrix that they're using to generate the diffusion schedule, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the practical dive. Um, and you can see that uh, it beats uh, GPT-2 in most or, in, you know, in three out of the five categories, um, but it is better than D3PM and Plaid, which are other discrete or other yeah, uh, text-based diffusion approaches. Um, so it is kind of a significant state of the art for diffusion and is also competitive with those autoregression models, at least in unconventional. You can see in both small and medium beating GPT-2 three out of five times. Then can you talk a little bit to, you know, at the start, we said sequential sampling is slower and it has its dependence on being parallelized at inference time. 
seems like we still have to sequentially sample in this case, but like there is some parallelization we can get from this type of model. Uh, what do you mean about like like the continuing to sequentially sample? Well, we're we're sampling in time instead of in uh, yes, what? yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So instead of like, I might uh, I might stick a pin in that because I have a graph about it in a second. Um, but the point. Perfect. The, the biggest point there being, yes, we're still taking many steps, but we're taking steps in a different dimension, uh, which will come up in a second. So one note on this is that the authors basically say, uh, we talked at the beginning about how there are those kind of additional ad hoc te techniques that are included to prevent the sequence from running wild in autoregressive generation, those annealing techniques like nucleus sampling. This comparison, I believe, is done with those techniques turned off for GPT-2 um, because the authors believe that the uh, those uh, sequences are kind of almost definitionally uh, improve that score kind of artificially above what the model would produce under under you know natural empirical conditions, but they do have a conditional generation test where they use a different metric that does not have the same um, weaknesses. So they are then able to compare against GPT-2 with its nucleus sampling, and they are still you know find that their approach is able to able to improve um, improve on that. So competitive at both conditional and unconditional with existing autoregressive approaches and uh, a lot better than existing diffusion approaches. So again, we're talking about GPT-2 here a lot. Um, why is this something that's impressive? This is a little bit of a rehash of the things that we discussed in the beginning, um, but with a little bit more context and understanding now. So the first is that we said autoregressive models like GPT-2 have to prompt from left to right. This text diffusion model does not have to do that. Um, and you know, in addition to being more parallelizable, that also gives us what we were talking about in terms of code completion earlier, right? The ability to infill. So instead of just prompting, um, you know, from the beginning and letting the model fill on the rest, we can, you know, diffuse a couple of tokens surrounded by a couple of other tokens. So that takes us from the hero watermelon controversy the day to the hero will save uh, will save the day. And you know, simple example, but lots of lots of possibility for extension there. Whoops, sorry, okay. Second of our big three things is that uh, there's reason to believe just inductively because of this that these models will have better long-term coherence because they don't need those kind of additional annealing techniques required um, to prevent generation degeneration at longer sequence lengths, right? These are all being generated as, you know, over time as one coherent whole, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but they don't need, they're able to achieve the performance of autoregressive models that do employ those additional techniques, which bias the generations in other ways, um, but they do not use those techniques. So they're able to kind of remain a little bit, um, a little bit more unfettered in that sense. Those techniques do tend to um, basically drop out the possibility of selecting very low probability tokens later on in the sequence. It's kind of what nucleus sampling does. So that does keep things from flying off the handle. Um, but I, I would argue that it also can kind of uh, limit the like, you know, creativity and variance of possible outputs um, if those kind of lower probability spaces at, at higher temperatures are not being explored as frequently. And then this third one is the big thing that Greg was talking about. And this is that diffusion models allow you to, you know, establish and pick pick your spots on a trade-off between how much compute you want and the sample quality. So I mentioned this earlier that, and Greg was talking about it just a second ago, that the diffusion process still does require you to, you know, it, it is still iterative, but rather than generating token one and then token two and then token three, you generate a bad version of the entire sequence, and then a slightly less bad version of the entire sequence, and you continue to do that, um, stepping through time and getting a little bit better each time. So basically more steps of that generation process leaves you with a higher quality generated sample, but also means you have to, you know, evaluate your network more times. And this type of trade-off, because of the autoregressive nature of things like GPT-2, is not something that we typically have access to. In that case, because the GB, you know, GPT-2 is not kind of iteratively improving its sample as it goes on, it is you know running 1,024 network evaluations, but that is to generate 1,024 tokens. So the authors did a perplexity comparison. You can see that the circles are um, are their networks, these SEDD networks, and the stars are GPT-2. You'll see that GPT-2 
are just frozen at 1024. That's because they have to make 1024 evaluations to generate a 1024 length sequence, no matter what. They don't have the ability to participate in this trade-off. Uh, but perplexity, again, going down here, so more network evaluations is better. Uh, with these lines indicating the performance of SEDD, if you want a really cheap um, evaluation that is not going to cost that much compute, but is also not going to be that good, um, you know, you can evaluate it as few as 32 times and get comparable performance to that of GPT-2 without that annealing process that we keep talking about. Or if you want to go even beyond that and you have compute to spare, you can choose to evaluate it double as many times um, as you ordinarily would and get an even higher quality sample as a result. So that type of trade-off does not really exist in autoregressive modeling. And I think it is a, a really exciting piece of this because it lets you kind of make the decision rather than by having to choose a different model, you can kind of make one model a little bit less expensive to run um, while kind of trading off some of the quality for that. Does that get where you were going, Greg? Yeah, totally. This chart is really cool. I wonder if you could even use this to like auto generate training data to make better samples mm -hmm. in like yeah. a DPO context. That would be wild. Yeah, that is cool. So takeaways, and then we can kill the recording and, and talk about uh, any questions. I think that this is a really promising uh, avenue of research. I think it's very cool seeing diffusion methods catch up on text because they have kind of been so dominant everywhere else. They've been really successful in imagery and um, video and very recently and topically um, in, in audio and in music generation as well. Um, I do think that just because they are competitive at this particular model size does not mean it will not be challenging to scale them up, does not mean they will necessarily be competitive with these larger models at even larger model sizes. Um, but I think it's a really a really exciting start, and I thought it was super cool. I'm excited to kind of dive into the, the code next week with Greg about it and, and present it back to you guys. Cool. Anybody? Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Uh, like Ben said, we'll be diving into the code next week. and. If you guys, you guys probably couldn't tell, but Ben is kind of like Michael Jordan on the flu game today. He's been sick all week and still pulled this off. So big round of applause for him putting this all together. That was super impressive. And I learned a lot, even having read the paper before. <laughs> awesome. We'll kill the recording and, and open it up for uh, questions here.